Hello everyone and welcome to this Dome 9 webinar on security automation for the public cloud. My name is Sudarsh Srinivasan. I'm the VP of Growth at Dome 9 Security and I'm here with Adrian Sanabria, Senior Analyst in Information Security at 451 Research. Now before we get started, a couple of quick logistics. This webinar is being recorded and it will be shared, so uh, don't worry, you're going to get the slides and the recording. All participant lines on this webinar are muted, so if you have any questions, please enter them via the chat window in GoToWebinar and we will get to the questions after the, after the presentation. So this is part of the Dome 9 webinar series. We have a number of upcoming webinars that you can find on the Dome 9 website at https colon slash dome9.com. So some of the topics are listed here. We have uh, Azure Cloud Protection on Feb 2nd. We have Software Defined Governance on Feb 9th. IAM Protection on Feb 23rd and Compliance on March 9th. So please come to the website, check out what's coming in terms of webinars. This is a series that we have kicked off. We have a lot of active content. And if you have ideas for things you want to hear from Dome 9, uh, or webinar topics you're interested in in security, please let us know because we want to make sure that this thing uh, is interesting for you. Dome 9 is going to be at RSA. Our booth number is 4429. So if you're going to be at the show, please come and say hi. We would love to show you what we are up to, what's coming. With that, I will pass the ball to Adrian Sanabria. Adrian? Thank you. Yep, Adrian, I have All a right. slide. Okay, sure, sure. Um, all right, so there's this thing that I call new IT. Uh, and I just ended up calling it that because uh, there's so many distinctions between, uh, you know, how people define DevOps and Agile and, and even cloud itself is such a broad term uh, that uh, really I just started seeing a big difference in how people do IT, how things are done, how they get their job done from day to day. Uh, using different skills, different tool sets, uh, and incorporating a lot of these uh, buzzwords we have floating around. So just in general, I call it new IT because it's completely different in how they do it. I'll be giving a lot of examples today, but uh, just to give you one up front, I, I remember watching a talk where uh, someone who worked for Duolingo was talking about how they managed IT. They're talking about however many millions of people use that platform to learn languages every day. And it took something like two people on the IT side to actually keep all the infrastructure running behind that. I thought that was, that was pretty amazing. And so we'll dive in today into how that's even possible and more so how on the security side we can leverage a lot of that and take advantage of those those opportunities to do a better job at uh, security and focus more on the things that matter and less on uh, rote manual processes and things like that. So so what is it? It's uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, DevOps loosely refers to the the people and the processes and uh, most importantly the culture that surrounds this. And then cloud uh, is just one of the tools we have. Uh, we've got many tools and products uh, that enable this. And, and then really, you know, that thinking, that cultural change uh, hits the business too. And I, I think at the beginning, you know, we kind of saw this as a, as a cool experiment uh, within IT, uh, and, and that's where a lot of the excitement uh, existed about it. And nowadays, more and more, as businesses understand, hey, we, we, we can compete better, we can be more responsive to what our competitors are doing, you know, they, they see the advantages for them here, and more and more it becomes uh, a requirement. Uh, and, and for that reason, I think it's a really important uh, trend to follow, because this, this really is uh, where a lot of IT is going and a lot of businesses. Uh, surprising to me, uh, it's really been the very large, you know, 100 years old plus businesses that, that have, uh, uh, jumped feet first into this uh, rather than going entirely from the bottom up, you know, smaller businesses, startups, and things like that. Though obviously we, we, we see a lot of it there as well. 
So note that security isn't on this slide. And I think it's important to keep in the back of our minds that security really, the goal is, is to keep it from hampering the business and hampering the goals. Uh, in itself, it is not really uh, one of the primary business goals. So the things that we have to consider with these changes here, speed and agility, I think, are, are two of the most important. You know, the ability to change our infrastructure to suit what we need very quickly is something that a lot of people uh, use the cloud for and, and like about cloud. And uh, the speed, you know, when we start talking about agile and lean and things like that, uh, doesn't allow for a lot of old security processes. A lot of the due diligence we might do uh, as a as, uh, project is developed and put together uh, when we're iterating fast, we're putting it out into production so quickly in a matter of weeks, uh, where in the past, you know, maybe it would have been a six, eight, 12 month uh, project, you know, before anything hit production, means that we have to uh, approach it differently. And resilience is one of the most exciting things from a security standpoint uh, to me. Because you know, now we're seeing, you know, from, from the very first design, you know, the minimum viable product, uh, that we have something that's highly available. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to bring down either by uh, malicious parties or, um, you know, success, you know, which is the, the fourth block there. You know, back in the day, we, we had, uh, if you're old enough, you remember the slash dot effect where, you know, something became very popular very quickly because it was posted on Slashdot and everybody immediately clicked the link, went over there, and your web server crashed, you know, because you weren't, uh, you know, you were small, you're still getting started, and you were not prepared for that level of, of uh, uh, attention on the Internet. So uh, <clears throat> we've got to figure out how to fit security in here where it's invisible, where it fits in uh, naturally. And, um, and with, without uh, holding anything up or, or hampering anything. <clears throat> so every year at 451, we put together, uh, I hate to call them predictions. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really think of them, uh, at least what I contribute to this as predictions. Uh, th this is more just where I see things going um, based on what's already happening, happening currently. And more so, I, I tend to throw out my opinion where I think things should be going, what should be happening, rather than trying to predict, uh, you know, what people will do. I, I think it's easy to predict uh, what, what's happening now, but more <laughs> is going to happen in the future. You know, I think it's, it's more important to say, you know, hey, yeah, maybe that's uh, happening in the uh, right now, but, uh, you know, we shouldn't see more of that. And I think in security, we're going to see many trends uh, even start to reverse there. Uh, and the cloud is a great example there, where there's just not room for the 1,500 plus uh, enterprise security vendors that we track at 451 uh, to fit in there. You know, a lot of those products, a lot of those vendors just don't uh, have a place there. And uh, we'll go into some of the reasons why here. So for each of these trends, we have recommendations, winners, losers. So you're getting a very small chunk of this. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big report, 20-page report. I'm just, uh, you know, kind of uh, cherry-picking some of uh, our favorite pieces here. And uh, so the first trend, we're really talking about new IT, this, this big seismic shift uh, in, in how we manage technology and infrastructure. And uh, clearly, I think, I think one of the winners, and I mentioned culture before, and I think that's a big piece of it, is that it's uh, to, do, to be successful in the cloud, you really have to disrupt the way you're doing things currently, uh, down to employee skill level. You know, your practitioners, uh, you know, everybody needs to understand how to, to code, how to automate things, you know, even if, if you're in security you know, more and more often you're going to end up with a huge pile of data in your lap and someone on the security team has to have data science skills. You know, so that's really where things are going and technology offerings also have to recognize that and have to suit that. You know, if I've got a big pile of data in my lap, 
uh, you know, my security tools, I need some way to get that data in and out of tools easily. I need those APIs, uh, you know, ways, ways to get data in and out, to transform it, uh, you know, and, and to get uh, meaningful uh, feedback on it. You know, say if we're, you know, collaborating with a threat intelligence tool here or something like that. And on the losers here, uh, we've seen a lot of this, and uh, you can just go to any marketplace in Azure and AWS and you see a lot of this, but you know, there's a lot of lift and shift, and I'm going to use that term a, a couple times here, but basically, uh, yeah, we have a virtual appliance, and, and we're just going to shove it in the cloud. And, you know, in some cases that makes sense for a transitionary period, but really doesn't make sense long term when a lot of these features and, and a lot of this functionality is already, already built into the cloud. So the analogy here that I came up with is it's, you know, it's kind of like going to a nice hotel and bringing your bed with you. You know, or even worse, bringing, you know, like a uh, uh, sleeping bag with you. I, 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 that's the whole point. You know, the, the bed's there. It's fully furnished. And this is what the cloud is. You know, it's, uh, they've already anticipated the tools and the building blocks you need. And if you even look at Amazon's AWS logo, it's a bunch of building blocks. Uh, so why would, why would you bring these building blocks with you, you know, that really, uh, you know, are built for something else? You know, I mean, that's, it's already in your home. Why would you move it out and bring it here? It doesn't make sense. So on the one hand, yes, it's, it's a pain to have to rebuild everything when you move to the cloud, but you're really not going to get uh, a whole lot out of it, especially from a security standpoint, uh, unless you re-architect for that and redesign for that. And to do that, you have to first understand what you're dealing with there. So trend four here, we're talking about uh, with cloud security, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, more convergence, less fragmentation. So the tools need to understand how to talk to each other. So again, we're talking about APIs, automating things, uh, you know, having a way to get data from point A to point B. I love to say, uh, you know, and I, I've been a practitioner a lot of my career, that email is a terrible API. You know, I still go into so many enterprises and, and see these guys, you know, on a daily basis or gals. Uh, you know, they receive an email from the FBI. It's a list of IP addresses uh, or, or perhaps, uh, you know, one security uh, system sees intrusions from certain IP addresses. You know, they take those, they copy and paste them into Notepad or they save them to a CSV file. And then they attach them to an email and send them to the firewall guy or the whoever manages the DNS so they can black hole those those IP addresses. And really that entire process, you know, and that's just one small example, I'll give some more later on, uh, where it should just be fully automated, you know, or at the very least, you know, within one of those tools, you just select the IPs you want to be blacklisted uh, and, and you push a button and the rest just happens. Uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't need to be uh, something going through the email system. So it's really tough to rip off that bandage, but that's how I've heard it described by almost every single company I've talked to who's been successful in the cloud. You know, they, they say they're, they try to go the easy route, migrate a little bit at a time, but really what they had to do is they had to hire some new people, uh, figure out what to do with some people who just weren't getting the, you know, the shift to the cloud, uh, you know, that cultural shift that, or didn't have the skills necessary. And, and they had to make some big changes, you know, and they had to disrupt uh, departments, had to re restructure, uh, you know, part of the IT organization, um, you know, buy new tools, figure out what they're going to get rid of. Uh, you know, just a very disruptive process, but in the end, very happy with the results. So trend five here, uh, we're talking about, um, <clears throat> you know, what does that mean? Uh, cloud and DevOps will go on a world tour. Uh, I didn't write that bit, but um, <laughs> basically we're, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, this is kind of a road show, you know, and it is, uh, 
uh, a smaller chunk of the market that, that's done this successfully thus far. Uh, we've seen a lot struggle with it, and part of the reason is just experience. And, uh, you know, if, I were, if you were to get just one thing out of this, you know, I would say if you're not already playing with the cloud, uh, there are free tiers on most of the services out there, uh, you know, or at least trial tiers, you know, for most of the tools. You know, find some excuse to play with it. You know, if it's just running Minecraft servers for your kids, uh, you know, or, or, you know, taking uh, threat intelligence and, you know, trying to analyze it in different ways, uh, you know, whatever. You know, start playing with the cloud, uh, learning the APIs, learning the different uh, features and building blocks and functions there, uh, even if it's something a bit simpler like DigitalOcean. Uh, which doesn't have a whole lot of features, which is part of its uh, attraction. You can get up and running very quickly, uh, easily in just an hour or two if you're used to running VMs. Um, but we really do need more of these skill sets. Uh, and I'm going to go over some of the details of those skill sets uh, later on in this talk. But uh, definitely the winners here are ones that build for tomorrow's problems. And what I should have said here is furthermore, build for tomorrow's problems with these new tools. Uh, because these new tools are really just a jump forward in how we can do things. You know, solving problems uh, for a lot of companies that use the cloud heavily, you know, they're not just running their infrastructure on it. Your average security analyst w might fire up 300 uh, cloud instances uh, just in a normal morning, you know, just because they, they need to process a uh, large batch of data to, to analyze it real quick. Um, and, and in terms of cost, that might mean, what, 10 bucks, something like that, you know, because they needed to run it for just a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, but they've already got all the automation set up for that. And, uh, and it's just become a normal uh, part of their... Uh, uh, normal tool in their toolbox to be able to do that. Uh, so you see a lot of that, where the cloud isn't just used strategically, uh, it, it's just you use it like you use a, a hex editor or something like that. It's just another tool uh, that, that security people are now using. All right, we, we can move on. So this is just a picture of in my mind, this is how I kind of see the whole information flow for security operations. Uh, and, and you can replace any of the logos here at the top with pretty much any security or IT uh, vendor logo. And most of them have some sort of API at this point, and they output some sort of logs from what they do. They have some events that come out. And if you look at the very first uh, piece on the bottom here, which is systems of record, and I've got the little database uh, diagram symbol there, uh, that's kind of your traditional SIM. You know, that's what we traditionally think of as, as a SIM is, for most companies, most of us, that's our system of record. And that's where we tend to put all these logs, we start to analyze them, and a lot of these SIM vendors are, are getting closer to helping us make a lot of these decisions, whereas in the early days, uh, you know, we had to do a whole lot of work uh, to get that kind of uh, good, actionable information out of a SIM uh, in, in the past. So we're getting closer to that. And I think more and more in the future, our, our SIMs will be in the cloud uh, because the data that we want to put into the SIM, the vast majority of it, is already going to be there. So it's not going to make sense to necessarily pull it on on-prem. And it'll be easier to deal with that data, to query that data, to analyze it, you know, be able to pull out subsections of it and, and do things with it. And even more importantly, as we work across, uh, I've got the, any of you are familiar with uh, military terminology, the, the OODA loop is just a general uh, guideline for assessing a situation. Uh, you know, so you, you observe to be able to observe, you have to have the logs. You have to get the logs in there in the first place uh, to understand what you have. You know, whether that's just a list of your assets, uh, you know, perhaps you did a vulnerability scan and it's the results from that scan, um, you know, down to application logs, 
and maybe the logs coming out of your WAF, uh, your firewall, things like that, and then correlating all those together. Uh, and then really the, the middle piece is the tricky part right now. You know, and that's where there's a lot of customization before you can get actionable uh, decisions out of it. Uh, so just analyzing that, correlating all that data together. And then finally, uh, the most exciting and important part here, uh, which I alluded to with my, my early example it, with the uh, email being a terrible API, is taking action. And, and in that example, it was uh, you know, just taking a list of IPs and black holing them in, in DNS. You know, it's nothing fancy. Uh, but in a lot of enterprises, you know, to get all the way through that loop, it's maybe 45 minutes, an hour, uh, you know, to email it, to gather it, you know, output it into different formats, input it. You know, you've got to log into the, the console with your web browser and maybe upload or copy and paste uh, some stuff in there and then save it. Whereas if you just automated that whole thing, I mean, the, com the compute time is maybe just a couple seconds, you know, with the network latency and taking all that stuff into account. Uh, and, and why wouldn't we do that, you know, for all these, these normal processes we do on a day-to-day -day basis? So this is just kind of a reference, uh, you know, to, to think through as you build some of this, these automation and orchestration use cases in your, in your mind. Or, or maybe on, on paper. <clears throat> so this is what it looked like in 2015 when I logged into AWS. And the reason I'm showing this to you, uh, so that if you would uh, continue building the slide here, I think there's maybe four things here. <clears throat> I forget the exact count. Uh, we should be good once we see a, a full count there at the bottom. Yeah, that's it. That's the last one. So uh, in 2015, uh, th this is what my AWS console looked like. And here's all the different options, all the different uh, products that you can manage through your AWS console. And the ones I've put a check mark in, that's where you can actually install software, where you actually have from the operating system up uh, enough control and access to uh, input your own uh, third-party applications, maybe uh, your own applications, uh, and, and run them in an operating system context, say uh, Linux or Windows or something like that. The rest of these all have to be managed either manually through a web browser, uh, as I'm doing here with the, with the screenshot, uh, or through an API. You know, so it's uh, important to understand that a lot of these building blocks we're now dealing with uh, to get the visibility on them or to, to do anything with them, uh, we do have to interact with APIs. And, uh, and, and that means having some uh, developer skill there, or at least having a product or a tool uh, you know, that can abstract the code for us. You know, maybe we don't have to write the Python. You know, there's pre-built pieces and we just uh, uh, configure and put them together uh, within, within yet another tool. And Taking you through the years, this is 2016, uh, we've added one more thing, a uh, device farm that we can put our own code into. Um, but uh, I think I counted wrong there, I put five, but it's four. And, uh, you know, but about 15 more things. And then 2017, uh, do you see a trend here? About every year, Amazon adds 15 new products, and only one of them is something where we can put our, our own code on. And uh, this, this year, or last fall, it was LightSail. So the rest of this is all API-driven. All right, another little reference just to, uh, just to show one of the things we're doing with the cloud here and uh, in the previous screenshots I just showed you is we're removing layers that don't make sense for us to have to manage manually anymore. You know, Amazon can manage this stuff for you. If, it, if I want to run a, a database, you know, why, why manage the operating system? Have yet another thing I have to patch and upgrade and, and all that mess. Uh, if I need a MySQL database, you know, they, they offer it as a service. You know, I don't have to patch uh, Solaris or Linux or, or Windows underneath anymore. So important to understand there that, uh, yeah, you can go to the next one. 
and we're just uh, moving further and further to what a lot of people are calling serverless, where you can stitch together entire applications, uh, you know, and businesses are, are doing this, uh, without ever touching an operating system uh, or managing operating systems directly. <clears throat> okay. So in the point there, there's nothing to patch, a uh, lot less to harden. Uh, you know, doesn't make sense for IPS, uh, WAF, stuff like that, because there's nowhere to install it or, or to run it in a lot of these cases. Uh, and there's nowhere to install endpoint security agents. And so we, we have to consider the, uh, the rest of this stuff, how we're going to manage it. Okay. <clears throat> so I think security uh, has always been a top not, not, I wouldn't say a pain point in, in the surveys we do, and we, we quarterly do surveys. Sometimes we do custom surveys at 451 just to, to get a feel of, uh, you know, where people are getting stuck with cloud adoption and things like that. And security has always been at the top of that list, but not necessarily as a pain point, more as a, um, just a general worry and, and concern. And some of the reasons that we sussed out as to why uh, that's the case you know, cloud, we hear people having all the success with it, you know, it sounds too good to be true, um, you know, but we, we often fear it because there's some aspect there where we feel more comfortable with stuff in our own data center because we, we can walk over there, we can see it, we can touch it, even though, you know, Amazon's, you know, company like, companies like Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, and Rackspace, all these guys are specializing to a point to where, as individual businesses, we'll, we'll never get to that level of uh, exacting, uh, you know, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for here, just uh, uh, organization, you know, and hardening, and, you know, down to, you know, looking at a single process and how can we improve this and make this more secure. You know, even though uh, we'll never get to that point, we're still more comfortable with stuff in our data center. You know, there, there are questions that are important to us we can answer that way. And you know, so that, that's been a, uh, 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 you know, uh, <clears throat> kept us from, from uh, more adoption. So we, uh, we see that less and less. You know, as we see other companies uh, successful with it, uh, as the cloud vendors open up more and more, that becomes less and less of, of a problem. Uh, and trust is also an issue. You know, you have to be able to trust um, that third party. And uh, more than anything, we've seen lack of experience is what causes us to fear uh, cloud, you know, especially from a security or a compliance standpoint. Um, but data barracks and right scale, and I think there have been others who, have done the survey, and every time it's done, as experience goes up, concern about security in the cloud uh, goes down. You know, so again, that's why I tell you, if you get nothing else out of this, you know, go play with the cloud, get familiar with it, uh, understand what the limitations and the constraints are, um, you know, where you can protect your data, even though you know you might not know exactly physically where it is or who has access to it. You know, there's still things you can do to uh, to satisfy those concerns there. Okay. So how do we turn the tables here? We go from fear to understanding all the uh, uh, nice stuff we can do with this here, and the the new opportunities and advantages we have. So automation is a, is a big one. You, you just, you can't get anywhere with the cloud. I don't care if you're talking about security use cases, business use cases. Uh, if you're a developer, automation is key. You know, th that's just how it's built. It's designed to be automated. So it's not a nice to have, it's a must. You know, so that's, that's something at every level uh, has to be there. Even compliance uh, automation is, is really important in the cloud. And again, you don't have to use any automation. You can use the cloud without it. I've seen people do it. But, it, you know, to someone who has, you know, who does have that mindset of uh, I'm going to automate everything I, I can automate, um, you know, it, it's almost maddening to see somebody doing things manually like that because you're, you're really, you know, there's less of a point of even using the cloud if you're not going to take advantage of that stuff. 
and, and again, when we when I say cloud, you know, it's not necessarily AWS, Azure, and all that. You know, you can do all this with uh, VMware as well. It's got APIs. You can do all that there as well. And as I mentioned before, at the very beginning talking about the speed, you know, once we get to Agile and Lean and things like that, uh, again, it's it's not a nice to have, it's just required. You know, you just can't throw enough bodies at the problem to do something in a matter of milliseconds. There, there's no amount of people you can you can throw at a problem uh, uh, to, to, uh, to solve it like you can with, with automation. So in addition to automation, we're, we're talking about understanding uh, what assets you have and what you can do with the APIs. So the APIs are your key language for interacting with the assets you have in the cloud. Uh, and the automation is just uh, how you put those two together. And, uh, and the missing piece here that glues all these together is your process. You know, what are you doing? You're trying to get threat intelligence uh, actionable. You know, that, that's a use case that takes all three of these and does something in milliseconds that, you know, might have taken us uh, uh, an hour before. <clears throat> and just some examples. Um, and I pulled everything you're seeing on this slide uh, came from actual job postings. Uh, and uh, just kind of an idea of what the traditional security practitioner would do and what the new practitioner does. If we go to the next, I kind of show the differences between the two. And the, the key ones you see pop up more and more. And in the analysis I did for this, I did this, uh, I think, mid-year mid last year. So it might have changed even more at this point. But we're already over 50% of the new security postings I was seeing, we're looking for people with the ability to code. And that included, uh, you know, it's, it's not the traditional developer role. You know, when I say knowing how to code, we're talking about uh, writing scripts, um, you know, solving problems like where you do have a whole lot of, lot of data and you need to do some data science, maybe use something like R to, to visualize some of what you have, or stitching things together. You know, taking one API, you know, say you, you're using Carbon Black and, and you also have Splunk and you want to get that data in there and you understand what you want to do and you need the skills to be able to glue those two together and get that data in there, visualize the way that you want it. <coughs> okay. And uh, so I, I resisted the, the Spider-Man uh, Uncle Ben with, with great power, great responsibility thing here just by showing a, a shunt trip for a, for a data center. Um, but definitely if, if automation scares you, it should because, uh, you know, you, you can uh, easily make a mistake with it. But at the same time, you know, the fact that you – you know, once you have proper development environments and everything like that, which, you know, when you're using it in security, you know, you have to do it just like the developers do it. Uh, you, you've got to test it. You've got to put in error handling, things like that. Um, it, it is a lot safer than doing things manually. But once you go through the proper process there and, and you, you tune it and you work out all the bugs. Uh, but uh, you, you certainly need those safety checks. You need the, the ability to shut something down quickly to stop it uh, or to see what went wrong and have that logging and error handling in there. So <clears throat> as, as security moves more to uh, these kinds of skill sets, you know, we, we've got to adopt um, you know, the, the same due diligence and the same uh, discipline that developers have, have to use to, uh, to do this properly too. Okay. And so in one example here, <laughs> I have no idea, but I apparently didn't finish writing that. <clears throat> my, my kingdom for some deployment scripts is what that should have read there, and, and apparently I've got some uh, uh, Spanish uh, uh, spell checking going on there. But um, <clears throat> Yeah, this was a really, really interesting story here. Knight, uh, a lot of people don't know who Knight Capital was. 
but basically they, they, they did trades on other companies and individuals' uh, behalf. Yeah, I, I don't understand the finance uh, public uh, uh, markets well enough in the finance industry well enough to, to really explain to you uh, who they were. But because somebody rolled out new code to only seven of eight servers, this happened. Basically, a, a server went to production running test code, and what that test code did is it tried to do just a bunch of crazy trades you would never do in real life um, just to make sure everything worked. You know, it was almost like a load test. And it, all, it, all it needed was 30 minutes uh, to lose uh, 440 million real dollars just because it, it was probably 3 in the morning, right, uh, on a Sunday morning that they were doing this because that's, that's when you make all the most important changes to your, uh, to your infrastructure is when people are sleep deprived and, and you know, the body's used to sleeping and the mind isn't used to uh, thinking clearly. So uh, that's probably when it happened, and and some poor sap missed uh, server number eight, and and this happened. So that's uh, it's just a great uh, use case, and this you can see it was 2012. This is a while ago, but um, yeah, nothing cloud or DevOps about this. You know, it, it's really just uh, putting resilience into your processes and into your uh, you know the stuff you do on a regular basis. You know, the more you automate it, the more you uh, script things out, you're actually documenting the process and making sure that you're doing it correct and repeatedly correct. So I've got some, I'm not going to read all of them. I've got some recommendations and best practices, but I, I'd like to draw your eye, obviously, to the automation study on the side here. I used to be a PCI QSA, and I actually went through every single uh, I think 287 requirements at the time, uh, and uh, assessed each one to see if you could automate pulling the evidence for it. Because if you've ever had to deal with PCI, uh, you know, the big pain there is when the auditor comes in, he wants a billion pieces of evidence, he's got to collect it all, and he's got to wrap it all up in a nice, nice neat bundle uh, for posterity. But he's going to ask for screenshots, for logs, for all kinds of different things. And 90% of it, I found, uh, you could automate it. And it, this is not automating it necessarily when the auditor comes in. This is just in real time all the time. And the next, uh, next item we have here, next slide, uh, if you'll go two slides ahead here, uh, here's an example. In real time, every time you uh, change is made to a firewall, you're going to generate the evidence, encrypt it, uh, you know, using PGP, using their the auditor's public key. Um, you know, just you wrap it up, put it in a directory. You know, maybe uh, I don't know if it gets emailed to them, if it gets put in a Dropbox directory that's shared with them. You know, pick pick your uh, pick your method there. Once it's encrypted, it's it's pretty flexible what you can do with that. But basically, uh, when that auditor needs to start your audit, they've already got a nice, neat pile of stuff. It saves them time. They don't have to pester you for it. Uh, you know, on 287 different requirements, you know, figuring out who to email for each one. And easier on you. You don't have to go into panic mode and, and stop all the important projects you're working on to, to get something for the auditor. So it, just, it makes sense all around. <clears throat> and last here, uh, just gonna, you know, uh, pull for time here. I, I, I can uh, have some anecdotes here that I can skip if we want to get to uh, to your slides. Suda. Sounds good, Adrian. Thank you for sharing uh, that wonderful analysis and lots of insights. I think there are a couple of things that you talked about that particularly resonated. Right? One was just you know, the cloud offers a lot of opportunity, but I think what many people don't realize completely is how different the cloud is from your data center infrastructure, right? In many ways, you know, you can you realize it when you talk about provisioning and managing applications and so on, but then when it comes to security, quite often people try to take a lift and shift approach to security, essentially taking their virtual 
firewall appliances, taking their virtual security appliances and trying to apply that in a cloud environment. And I think that in many ways misses the point because as you had said, you know, all the big public cloud providers have been investing very heavily in building security, not just the security of the core platform itself, but security mechanisms and capabilities into the platform. Right? And it's all about how do you use that to provide and to, to manage security in your cloud environment. So now, according to a recent survey that was done uh, in the in the LinkedIn community, the information security community, sort of fielded to over 350,000 professionals, the top concern even today that is preventing people from going to the cloud, right? One of the biggest barriers is security, right? Over 34% of the respondents said, you know, general security risks, managing security in their cloud environment is the top concern when it comes to going to the cloud, right? And if you look at the top cloud management challenges, the first one by far is visibility into your infrastructure security, understanding what your security posture is in the cloud. That is one of the top challenges, right? And the second one that you had talked about, Adrian, was compliance, right? How do you manage your compliance lifecycle in the cloud? How do you maintain compliance? How do you prove compliance, report on it, and so on? The whole life cycle of compliance. And the third one is setting consistent security policies, right? So how do I manage security in a way that allows me to share the resources I need without exposing things too much, right? So some of the things that we have actually heard from customers, there are three broad areas, right? Security operations, things like I don't really understand the effective security posture that I have when it comes to you know, security groups, IAM policies, all said and done after I have set everything, I don't have understanding of my security posture. And these are problems that you see at scale, right? Uh, the second one is access permissions, right? Knowing who has access to what resources at what times. And then, you know, misconfigurations in terms of ports and services. Someone accidentally left a database server exposed to the public, and now all of a sudden MongoDB is getting attacked in your cloud environment, right? This happens a lot. Then when it comes to compliance and governance, things that you talked about, right? How do I show documented proof of compliance in a way that doesn't require me to go and manually collect this data, right? I don't have to go and manually fix it. Just that managing that entire compliance life cycle becomes a challenge. And the third one is just, you know, if you're talking about DevOps, you know, you really need security to not become a roadblock or uh, a break on your DevOps operations, right? So if you think about the software development life cycle, there was a very interesting study done uh, by the guys at Puppet, uh, the State of DevOps Survey, that said, you know, you can save up to 50% by building security into the software development life cycle all the way through from your design phase rather than doing security at the end of your product development. Because when you do that, quite often, you know, if you find something, if there's a vulnerability, then you're forced to trade off, you know, going live with those security vulnerabilities versus going back to the drawing board all over again, right? So if in, in, instead, if you had security kind of built into the process at every step, you would be saving a lot of time and money, right? And so this is really what you're talking about. These are some of the real-world operating challenges when you talk about cloud security. So what Dome 9 is, Dome 9 is a SaaS platform, Dome 9 Arc. It's a, it's a SaaS platform that allows you to manage security and compliance across public cloud environments. So we've, we've been uh, on Amazon, we are AWS Advanced Technology Partners with Security Competency. What we provide is security orchestration in your public cloud environment. We recently announced support for Microsoft Azure as well. So what do I mean by that? Domain Arc allows you to assess your security posture, that is, look at your network topology, understand what's going on, where your vulnerabilities are, if there are any misconfigurations or any gaps in your security, allowing you to see it very clearly so that you can go and take remediation steps before they become issues, right? And the second one, in-place remediation, rather than just giving you visibility, Domain allows you to go and make changes in place. So within the Domain platform itself, so that you're fixing these policy configurations, right? You're making sure that the way you've set up security, the security infrastructure in your cloud environment is set up correctly, right? You're able to model gold standard in terms of security policies and actively protect, not just, you know, uh, look at what's broken, but actively protect and make sure that, you know, you have minimum access where required, right? You're reducing your attack surface. And finally, enforcing security best practices, 
uh, and managing compliance lifecycle, right? So Dome 9 is, in that sense, a converged platform. One of the things you talked about was convergence, right? How you need to have, rather than a fragmented view of security with lots of different tools doing their own thing, what Dome 9 strives to do is to give you essentially one place where you manage the infrastructure security posture, okay? So how do we do that? We have three broad areas in the, in the product. Our code, bread and butter, essentially the IP from where Dome 9 started is network security, right? Understanding your virtual private uh, clouds, VPC security groups, VPC flows, really understanding all of that, looking at your IAM security posture, which users have access to what resources, being able to lock down your IAM security so that uh, even if your root account is compromised, right, or even if an admin account is compromised, uh, attackers still don't have kind of keys to the kingdom in terms of going and making changes, going and changing your DNS entries and so on. And the third piece that we announced uh, in September last year is the compliance and governance piece, right? Essentially, how do you manage the compliance posture? How do you take care of automating things like PCI DSS compliance, you know, checking, uh, remediation, and reporting? Right, so PCI DSS, uh, when it comes to best practices, the AWS CIS benchmarks, we essentially give you a way to automate a lot of the steps involved in maintaining compliance in your cloud environment. Okay, I just want to point out a couple of different things that are there in the product. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but Dome 9 Clarity, right? Clarity is a visualization tool that we have as part of the Dome 9 Arc platform that essentially constructs this visual-like diagram in real time of your cloud environment, right? So you take any VPC, it basically creates this view of all your cloud assets, security groups, instances, external IP addresses that are referred in your security group policies, and so on, allows you to see at a glance what your security posture looks like, right? Clarity does this automatically. It categorizes the cloud assets that you have based on their level of exposure to the public. So you, everything you see on the on red here, right, the, that, that is the external, right? Those are all external IP addresses or external uh, entities. And as you go to the right, these are all internal and effectively seen only by other entities within your cloud environment. And this kind of categorization happens automatically, right? So this allows you to basically see at a glance if, for example, you have a database server sitting on the left side in your DMZ, someone has probably misconfigured access to that to allow it to be seen by the public, right? And we have things like VPC flow log visualization built on top of this. So you can kind of see, you know, what your VPC flows look like, where there is drop traffic in your cloud environment and so on. And we also have integration with cloud formation. So you can do this kind of visualization on a cloud formation template even before you deploy that template to a cloud environment. Right, so essentially you're able to build this kind of uh, analysis into the pre-deployment phase of your cloud environment, okay? So this is really, uh, just to give you kind of a contrast of what we are doing here, right? This is kind of the view that you get from AWS. You get to see, in a security group, you get to see all the policies, each IP address individually listed and so on, right? So this is kind of the detailed view. Works great when you have a small number of instances. What Dome 9 allows you to do is go from this kind of visualization, which is very granular, a little hard to figure out what is your effective policy, to this kind of visualization, right? Take that information, give you kind of a visual way of looking at it, and allow you to manage, essentially, the security group policies and so on in a much more effective way, right? Compliance Engine is the dashboard, as I mentioned, that allows you to manage compliance lifecycle, right? Look at where the gaps are in your compliance, run automated tests against PCI DSS, run automated tests against the AWS CIS benchmark. We have our own best practice suite, so you can create your test suites and run them against your cloud environments, right? So Dome 9, you know, one of the things that I do want to call out here, you're not installing anything, it's all SaaS, so you effectively just providing uh, IAM-based access to the cloud environment so that we can see what's going on, and you are able to get up and running in under five minutes. Right? We are agentless. This is one of the big things that you need to think about. You know, as the cloud providers are building API-based access to their clouds, you should basically not have to reinvent and rebuild security on top of that. Right? So we use the cloud-native capabilities, the APIs that are provided by the cloud environment, 
essentially that means that you don't have to install agents anywhere. If you remember what Adrian had talked about, the 2015, 2016, 2017, increasingly you have services that are part of your AWS environment in which you cannot put your own code. You cannot put an agent to monitor and manage. Right? This is really where an agentless architecture is essential in a public cloud because that means that 90% of your cloud environment cannot be even seen using an agent-based technology. Right? With an agentless technology, you're able to manage your entire environment without having to install agents or anything. Right? So it's an API-based approach. And you know, this is a platform that is not just monitoring, not just visualization. It is end-to-end -end infrastructure security management, right? orchestration in your cloud environment. So our customers use this for compliance monitoring and management, uh, securing their DevOps, essentially the rugged DevOps uh, practices and security operations in the cloud. Okay. With that, we have some time, uh, around 10 minutes for Q&A. We've had a few questions, uh, Adrian. The first one is for you. Uh, has there been a relatively successful lift and shift operation, right? Are there conditions that can make lift and shift a winner? Yeah, yeah, and and I think there actually are. You know, so you know, the whole cloud thing here, they, this isn't an all or nothing, and I, I think that's a mistake in, in thinking about it. Um, you know, companies aren't moving their entire data center into the cloud all at once. You know, they're 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 moving things that make sense to move together, like you know that may, maybe their uh, <clears throat> their main customer application will go into the cloud. Like if you take uh, Uber, for example, you know, the whole driver facing stuff, customer facing stuff, the apps, uh, all that stuff, all, all that lives in the cloud. But the company has uh, the corporate side that they, they very much have SAP and, and very traditional um, data centers, you know, with, with servers and things like that in, in them. And, uh, you know, some of that's in cloud, some of it's in traditional data centers. Uh, and, and that's what makes sense for them. That stuff doesn't need to change that much. They don't need a whole lot of flexibility there. Um, it, I'll, I'll give one example where uh, uh, I, I can't mention the, the name of the company, but uh, you know, they moved everything they could into the cloud, everything that made sense, um, but their, their core application was based around this, this, uh, all, all this uh, old code uh, that ran on VMS on alpha. Uh, architecture, you know, the old uh, digital DC alpha uh, servers, you know, that got acquired by, by Compaq and, and then HP. And they, they just couldn't get it off that, uh, you know, they, no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't. So they actually ended up, uh, and, and they're running it in AWS now, this, this whole system uh, it, within an emulation layer. So they lifted and shifted it into the cloud. And it's still easier for them to manage in the cloud, even though this code still thinks it's running on DEC Alpha uh, systems, though it's doing it through emulation on top of uh, probably EC2 is, is what they're using there. So, so that, that was a lift and shift win. You know, that was a, it was a compromise, but, uh, but it still helps them out. Absolutely. And, and I, think, I think there are some valid questions about you know, lift and shift, it's good to say you don't have to do lift and shift, but quite often you have stuff that is in your data center that you need to bring to the cloud. And lift and shift may be kind of the first way in which you get workloads out of your data center without, while minimizing disruption, right? And I think depending on how much, how much time and what kind of planning has gone into it, you may be able to transfer things, you know, think using things like database migration services and so on, you know, the tools right. are, are being built to make this process of going from your on-prem, you know, server migration, database migration, migration tools are being provided by the cloud providers. That being said, maybe you land using a lift and shift approach, but definitely something to keep in mind is, you know, you are not using the full potential of the cloud if you're doing a lift and shift. It might be the best way to get started, but over time you have to think about what kind of uh, evolving into a cloud-based architecture is going to look like. Would you say that's, uh, yeah. that's accurate? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we actually, you know, just just to tack on to the end of that and and uh, take care of some follow up questions here that are kind of around the same thing. Um, earlier, when I was talking about ripping off the band aid and it being painful to move to the cloud, 
uh, yeah, stuff like uh, messaging buses, you know, you're still using uh, TIPCO and things like that, you know, that, that don't have a one-to-one -one mapping. Yeah, there, there's no migration tool uh, for, for that stuff in the cloud. So, I mean, that, that, that's a complete redesign. And, uh, and yeah, there, there's no easy button for that going into the cloud at this point. You know, you can lift and shift it. Um, and if that helps you in some way, uh, then, then go for it. If it doesn't, then don't move it to the cloud. Uh, until you can figure out how to do that uh, in a better way. Like I showed, you know, we, we're seeing 15 uh, new products uh, in Amazon alone, and, and, and Microsoft and Google are building different stuff. You know, they're, they're not all one-to-one -one competing exactly against each other. So, uh, you know, what you're looking for may be built uh, in the future, uh, but, yeah, right now there's no easy answer for a lot of this uh, middleware, you know, that still stitches uh, applications together. Yeah, uh, we have one time for just one more question. Uh, what are your recommendations for securing microservices? Yeah, so it's really important to understand, uh, you know, when we're talking about APIs here, you know, we've got this whole management plane, which is uh, what you were seeing on the on the Dome 9 slides there and, and how, you know, Dome 9 abstracts some of that for you. Um, but, uh, yeah, a platform like Dome 9 can, can take care of, uh, you know, some of the more obvious use cases and allow you to, to easily build more on, on top of it there. But it depends on the, on, on the microservice. Um, one of the things you want to look at on everything is role-based access control. You want to isolate and uh, employ the, uh, in security, I think one of the most important concepts is the principle of least privilege. You think about, okay, what needs access to SQS? You know, who needs to change things within that? Uh, or, or what applications need to, need to touch that in some way? And uh, you just default deny everything and, and just add the, the bare minimum uh, that you need to. You know, and maybe something only needs read-only read access, you know, and, and you've given it read-write. You know, so always look for ways to uh, take away uh, access that's never going to be used, ne never going to be needed, except in a situation uh, that where an attacker might use it. You know, we see people ransoming uh, people's uh, clouds, and if you if you break things into pieces, if you do that isolation and least privilege, it makes it much much harder for someone to um, take the whole thing. You know, you you never want. Uh, uh, you know, one root account to have access to all your objects in the cloud. So that's just Very one cool. example want, there. Yep, you want to reduce your blast radius to the extent possible, right? Create enough, uh, essentially, segments so that you don't have one account managing mm -hmm. everything. So we are just about out of time. want to end with a couple of quick reminders for everyone. Uh, we have a number of other webinars coming up. I hope you enjoyed this content. If you have feedback, please share with us. If you have any other questions, feel free to drop us a note and we'll make sure that Adrian or I will answer your question. We have a number of webinars coming up and Dome 9 will be at RSA. So if you're coming to the show, please swing by the booth. Uh, we have a lot of fun giveaways, but we also have cool demos that you can come and see the Dome 9 product in action. Uh, and we will share a recording of this webinar with everyone on the line. Thank you very much. Adrian, appreciate the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me.